And thanks, Gail, for having me back. It's a, it's a great conference, and this talk should be particularly a lot of fun. So this is about Linux and versus Slash performance differences. I've come up with new diagrams. I am, my name is Brennan Gregg. I'm the lead performance engineer at Joint. I work with performance. Often I do head-to-head -head studies, and so understanding the performance difference is what I do for a day job. Uh, you might know me from various tools I've written or visualized. I previously did kernel engineering at Sun, and I worked on DTrace and ZFS and performance. A joint, just to mention who uh, my company is, is a high-performance cloud infrastructure company. We compete on cloud instance and OS performance, which is what I do. Uh, OS virtualization for bare metal performance. That's zones. That's one of the, the big Solaris features. <coughs> Core developers of Alumos and SmartOS and Node.js. And KVM for Linux guests. Only on Thursday, we launched the certified Ubuntu One Giant is now available, which is really fun. It's got a much newer kernel, so I'm happy. Uh, last year at scale, I gave a talk on Linux performance analysis. That was, that was really awesome. And I came up with a diagram people loved. I've, I've put an updated version on my homepage. <laughs> And this year I'm talking about Linux and Solaris performance differences. I covered this in my new book, Systems Performance, which was released late last year. I think we have a copy sitting down the front. The focus of this book was to understand, investigate methodologies that we couldn't 10 years ago, because we really have the freedom to pose whatever questions we want of the system. This talk, I'm going to start with why systems differ, get into some specific differences, and then go through, I'll start with what Solaris can learn from Linux, and then get into what Linux can learn from Solaris, and what both can learn. And then for results is uh, how they, in my experience, how they differ in terms of performance. Uh, for terminology, uh, you'll see me mention SmartOS. SmartOS is the operating system that we use at Giant for running cloud instances. Uh, we also have Linux, KVM guests. SmartOS runs the Illumos kernel. The Illumos kernel is uh, a, the active fork that's being actively developed, open source, from the Solaris kernel. And the open source kernel came from the Solaris kernel. So it gets a bit confusing, but at the end of the day, uh, these days the, the really active work is on SmartOS and Illumos. I will be talking about uh, Oracle Sol uh, Solaris versus Linux, but I'll actually be talking about for when I wanted to get to specific examples, because that's what I do every day. So I'll start with why systems differ. And does the system even matter? Will your application perform the same on Linux and Solaris? So well, to explain this, I'll start with something really, really simple. Uh, this is a Perl one-liner. It counts from 0 to 100 million, and it sets a string. To simplify this further, we're not interested in uh, program start, so where we uh, do various system calls and we're, we're bringing up system libraries. We're only interested in the performance of the loop when it's running. Would this differ between operating systems, or should this basically run the same? Should this program just go on CPU and then run the same? Doesn't matter if it's uh, Linux or Solaris. So this is something you can think about. Uh, does anyone? Think that this, this is just run. This particular example is just going to run the same. It's the same thing. So a lot of people are not keen to put their hands up. Some people have. So um, uh, one of these is Linux, and the other is, is Smart OS, and this is running on the same hardware. And there's a 14 percent difference, even though this one liner looks pretty simple. Imagine I'm not going to tell you which system is which, but imagine your system was the slower system and it was 14% slower, or it was 20% slower, 30% slower, you kind of want to know why. Why does my system run this slower? This actually came up recently. I had a customer working on a, a performance issue. It was really complicated, involved TCP, <coughs> distributed application. In order to narrow it down, they thought, let's just run a simple one line. I think they're using Python. Let's just do a simple one liner loop to see if the CPU speed is the same between the systems I'm testing. And that's a great methodology. Let's, let's boil it down to something simple and then debug that. And once we fix the, fix the performance issue there, then we'll go to something more complicated like your environment. But as the customer didn't realize, this is actually already pretty complicated. And there's already, already a lot of differences just for the one liner. So how can this differ between the systems? You could be running different versions of Perl. Okay, 
So applications improve performance from release to release. Linux and smart OS distributions use entirely different package repos and different software versions are common. Uh, and you may say, well, that's not really the operating system, it's not really the kernel, this is, this is an externality of the system. Well, actually, when you're a customer and you don't know this, and I'm trying, I'm trying FreeBSD, and I'm trying SmartOS, and I'm trying Linux, you, you may think that this is actually a system difference. So this is something we want to think about, is the package ecosystem. That, is, that does matter. Different compilers used to build Perl. So compilers come from package repos too. I've seen a 50% performance improvement by going from an older version of GCC to a newer version of GCC. And it happens. Compilers are doing all sorts of wonderful compiler opt optimizations. I don't agree with all of them, but many of them uh, do make a very big difference. Different compiler options used to build Perl. I have actually seen something like this recently. If def Linux minus 03 else the rest of the world can go really slow. <laughs> and uh, it, it kind of sucks if you are the rest of the world. I'll, I'll get into that more in a moment. But it's, it can legitimately be a difference here. And also 32-bit versus 64-bit builds. Different system libraries. So Perl does use the standard library. So Perl does a lot of string manipulation. So it's going to be using libc. It might be using strcmp, strlen, whatever. The system libraries are implemented differently between the operating systems. So, and how malloc is implemented hugely varies. And uh, one of our engineers, Robert Mustaki, enhanced LibUMEM, which is our high-performing user space library, to improve malloc performance as a competitive differentiator. And Perl uses malloc, so this can, this can be another difference you have between systems. And it can be a big difference. Different background tasks. So systems run different demons, uh, different housekeeping things, that can differ as well. Another difference is, can the 14% be root caused? Observability tools differ. These don't cause the 14%, but they mean, will you debug and fix it or not? Dtrace, which I want to get into, especially on Linux, has meant that anything can be solved. Previously, without an equivalent on, on Linux, it may have meant that you wear the 14%. Because I can't, I can't get into the kernel and, and debug the issue in the same way. And that puts Linux at a disadvantage. And it's not its own fault. It's not that the kernel is slower. It's that you can't go and debug what often are very simple, dumb problems that a good profiler will fix straight away. And so observability tools do matter for the resulting performance that you experience in production because it's the difference between whether you find and fix all the dumb stuff or whether you have to wear the dumb stuff because you just can't, it's prohibitive to actually go and analyze that. And the kernel, can the kernel make a difference for this really simple one-liner? Um, note, the program makes no system calls during the loop. So anyone think the kernel might make a difference here? Okay, now I've got a lot more hands. Good, good. Uh, absolutely. The setting the string involves memory I.O. and the kernel controls memory placement. Allocating nearby memory in a numerous system really significantly improves performance. There's a lot of performance work being done recently on both systems, both kernels, about improving memory locality and doing memory groups or memory domains. And uh, when you're hot on CPU, you're actually doing uh, memory store cycles. And so performance can be a big difference there. The kernel can also control the CPU clock speed, so for example, Intel speed step, and that's the kernel doing it. That's not Intel turbo, turbo boost. And that implementation is different between the systems. And so in one system, it may be running the CPU slower because the kernel decided to, and that means the one line is running 40% slower. The program could be perturbed by interrupts, so network I.O., although the performance effect should be small. During a perturbation, the kernel CPU scheduler may migrate the thread to another CPU, which can hurt performance. Okay, so I'm running my Perl one line, it takes 16 seconds, a network interrupt comes along, um, it runs its interrupt service routine. Does the kernel decide, my Perl program, by the way, is now on the CPU scheduler queue, does the kernel decide to migrate it because it doesn't want it waiting too long on this network interrupt? Here I've used Dtrace to profile what CPUs this one-liner ran on on an older version of SmartOS. And 
During the 16 seconds, what this shows is that one liner ran on CPUs. 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 30. What the heck are you doing? You're supposed to just pick one CPU and stay there. Picking one CPU and stay, staying there means you improve, you improve memory locality, you improve cache warmth, so hitting out of the level one cache as much as you can. Getting it to walk all over the, the CPUs is, is really bad idea. And so we've actually been fixing this in SmartOS. But again, it's the kernel that's actually doing this. And the kernel makes a big difference. Even though it's a CPU bound program and it's not making system calls, the kernel is deciding to move it around the CPUs based on uh, interrupt that perturbs performance. So I just did, I wanted to bust a myth about the kernel gets out of the way of applications. Uh, the only way, the only time the kernel gets out of the way is when your software calls halt or shut down. <laughs> when the kernel gets out of the way permanently, um, I actually, I was reading the halt and shut down code and I found this unintentional kernel humor where it says, CPU die, call CPU halt, and this is in the Linux kernel, and then it should never be here. <laughs> Bug, and then an infinite loop. It's like, it's like if, if we get here, it's, we've told the CPU to stop. The CPU won't stop. What do we do? I don't know, infinite loop. That's it. We can't have the CPU keep going when it's supposed to be dead. So uh, there you go. There's, act there's actually infinite loops in the, in the kernel on purpose. Um, so the kernel can make a difference. The performance difference between them Maybe smaller, maybe 5%. I've already seen a 5x difference in kernel performance this year, and I'll, I'll get through that example in a bit. So can they actually make a big difference? The example I just went through was pretty simple. It was just a Perl one-liner. Um, there are many, many more differences once you start doing network I.O. When, when, when you start doing any form of I.O., that system calls you going into the kernel, so ne different network stack implementations, uh, different TCP IP features, Linux is, is, is really up to date with those. Different file systems, different storage I.O. stacks, device drivers, device feature support, and so on and so on. Now, I've decorated a, a diagram with just the types of differences that can matter. And of course, this all started when a customer tried this one, one line of Python test to compare the differences between one CPU and another, and I'm explaining, you know, this is not a simple test. If, if I'm doing a simple CPU test, what I do is I write an assembly, not a program, which is a knock loop, where I call the knock instruction in a loop, and that's it. Uh, that's a simple program, and even that can get interfered, like the kernel can still kick it off, uh, and walk around different CPUs, and um, uh, turbo boost can make the runtime vary, you need to turn that off in BIOS if you're doing benchmarking and so on. It's actually really, there's a lot of differences that can happen. So specific differences. So comparing systems, so, so what is the difference between Linux and SmartOS or Linux and something else? I'm often asked, how is Australia different from the US? I come from Australia. And it's actually a difficult question to answer because they're so different. It's, well, here in the US, uh, you don't call it cricket, you call it baseball. And the bats are round and they're always doing hook shots. And the games only go for three hours. They're supposed to go for five days. So anyway, <laughs> I could go on and on. I'll categorize performance differences into big or small, not based on the, the effect on performance, but the engineering cost to fix. If I told you, hey, you can go to SmartOS and you'll be two times faster, but you can fix it in Linux, it just takes five minutes to fix, you're probably not going to go to SmartOS. So it's really important to know what is, the, what is your engineering cost to fix that performance delta. If I told you you can go to SmartOS, it's two times faster, and it's just unfixable in Linux, you just can't fix it then now it's more interesting because now there's a, there's a gain I can't normally have. And so we always have to, and vice versa is true as well, so you always have to uh, bear in mind what is the uh, engineering cost to fix that. If you're on the slower system and you, and you don't want to move off the slower system. I've actually heard it said that to convince customers to change environments, you need at least a 30% performance win. Um, and once it's less than that, the, the costs for ownership and retraining staff is not worth it. So your, your number can vary on just dimension like I have heard that said before. Big differences. The big differences between Linux and SmartOS, I've got a list here but I'll go through them. On Linux, up-to-date packages. I said I do this as a day job where I'm looking at Linux performance, often on competitive clouds versus SmartOS performance and, and we're, we're actually now really good at it because we have staff who are keeping it up to date. In fact, they say that we're, we're even, even better than Linux. But it, it's something that, that you have to pay attention to, is 
Um, who's looking after the package rep repositories? Linux has a huge community, community that does it, and they often have the latest versions of things. And so it's a, it's a, it has, in the past, been a big difference. Large community. So in Linux, you've got a weird performance issue. Um, maybe answered on Stack Overflow or discussed at meetups. If you're on another system, like uh, Solaris, and you're trying to find your Stack Overflow, that might be more difficult. More device drivers. It, as it turns out, uh, device driver vendors, um, these days, it's pretty easy to get a Linux device driver for things. Linux is fantastic with device drivers. It can get really hard to get a, it's getting, it seems to be getting increasingly difficult to get a Solaris device driver for things, and especially for exotic performance features. So my card, it, it has multiple ring buffers, you have to enable it, and it has this bypass mode in the kernel, and all of that stuff, the, 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 the vendor of the device has made it work on Linux, but that engineering work hasn't yet been done for Solaris. And so that can be another big difference between them. It's, it's not just the device driver, but also the extra features the device driver has. Mutex, fast user space Mutex, Linux has RCU, recopy updates, ButterFS from modern file system. Um, and I'll go through some of these, actually. I've got more slides for these. I have scheduling classes. So in Linux, you we have the, the IS scheduler where you can pick deadline, anticipatory, and uh, control have a means to control the performance of the block device level. Uh, that doesn't exist in, in smart OS, although they tend to use ZFS and the ZIO pipeline for, for roughly doing something equivalent. And some, actually, there's been some recent work in ZFS for that. Uh, Overcommitting the loom killer is another big difference I'll get into, and actually get into all of these in a moment. Configurable. Uh, with Linux, there's config options throughout the kernel, and so we can build very lightweight kernels that run on embedded devices as well, by turning off a lot of stuff if we want. And so that amount of work and that amount of configurability doesn't exist in uh, the Solaris kernel, the Illumos kernel. Big differences on SmartOS, mature zones, OS virtualization for high uh, performing server instance. Actually, I'll get through, I'll get through all of these in more detail in a moment. Uh, this one, mature, fully preemptive, preemptible kernel so Sun has been supporting financial industries, uh, high-performing environments for decades, uh, including those that have a requirement for real-time systems, and has made the kernel fully preemptive. Uh, and it's mature. Linux does, you can turn this on in Linux. It's just been mature for a long time in uh, the Solaris kernel. Microstate accounting, I'll get into, get into these in a moment. CPU scalability, it's at Sun and at Oracle, that the engineers have access to extremely large, I used to do, I used to do uh, engineering work myself there, you have access to extremely large systems whenever you want and you can test CPU scalability on dozens and dozens of cores or uh, physical CPUs. And uh, it's, it's and, and you can always be surprised about how negative scalability can happen in different code paths. And so it's something that's worth testing. Uh, multiple page size support, not just huge pages, so on, on SmartOS, it can be configured to use 4K pages and 2 meg pages and 1 gig pages, whatever the processor actually supports. Uh, LibUMEM, I did mention briefly, that's a high-performing memory allocation library. A couple of features for improving network performance, so the network stack has had a lot of work. Uh, binary proc, just a, a... This is not actually going to make a big difference in terms of performance, because the uh, you shouldn't be reading proc that often anyway. And so the performance delta should be small, I mentioned it as a big difference because the engineering cost to rewrite proc would actually be large. You just have to rewrite all the consumers to actually use a binary interface. Linux does have some binary uh, parts of proc or binary to get efficient data, but um, it would be a lot of work to completely redo proc. Uh, and process swapping I'll get to in, in a moment. So, I decorated a picture of the, uh, the Operating systems, so applications, and then I've got the system call interface in the kernel, and then where generally many of the differences lie. There are many smaller differences. And I'll just pick a couple. So what have we got? We've got uh, Puff State is fantastic. Uh, SmartOS and well, Slice doesn't have an equivalent. It's a great, great tool for observability. Uh, I am nice because you've got the IS scheduler. You can you can set priorities there. Uh, MPSTAT has since steel column. We haven't done that in SmartOS yet. We need it. Uh, swappiness, 
is a tunable that just doesn't exist on smart OS. Uh, I'll go through those. And some of the smaller differences in smart OS includes uh, load averages are actually CPU only, so I can interpret them. And ISTAT has minus E for an error column. Anyway, there are lots of smaller differences between the systems. And they change frequently, so the list I just gave you will be out of date uh, pretty quick. I do want to mention system similarities. These are both Unix-like systems, so you have processes and the kernel and system calls and time sharing and, and so on and so on. And there are many similar modern features as well. So both systems have a unified buffer cache, memory map files, uh, we've got CPU sets, and processor sets, 64-bit support. Both of them have big frameworks for doing memory locality really well. Uh, resource controls, C groups versus resource controls, and so on and so on. So there are actually a lot of similarities between the systems as well. I'm not going to go through non-performance differences because I just wanted to do performance in this talk. But uh, one big difference between Linux and Oracle Solaris is Linux is open source. And Oracle Solaris currently isn't. Um, and the belief that everyone knows it works on embedded Linux. And for Smart OS, uh, SMF FMA for the fault management architecture, it's great for doing highly available systems. Postmodern debugging is great. And crash dumps by default, which we really believe in as well. So, anyway, there are non performance differences as well. So, that's the first two sections. I just wanted to show that systems do differ. Uh, and go through just some quick specific differences between Linux and Smart OS. The next section is where I'm, I'm actually going to see what one can learn from the other. And uh, it's not suitable for those suffering not invented here syndrome. Uh, it's because this is just about what you can learn from someone else uh, or those who are easily trolled. But it's really fascinating anyway. So what Solaris can learn from Linux performance to start with? So, here are some items. This is either learning what to do or learning what not to do. Packaging. I already mentioned this. Linux package repositories are often very well stocked and updated. Uh, it means that users tend to run newer software versions along with the latest performance fixes. They'll find Linux is faster, but the real difference is the application. And Solaris may get unfairly blamed. And it's something that, Sol that Solaris needs to learn. We've been learning this for SmartOS. Uh, Joint has dedicated staff for the SmartOS package repo, which is based on package source. So it's not just the operating system that matters, it's the ecosystem. Because when users are trying out your operating system, they, they may not debug it and realize that it was just a different version of Perl. Or just a different version of OpenSSL is one I had recently, where the version number of OpenSSL made was a 30% difference. It was very significant. And uh, it was only when we started debugging what packages each system had did we get to the bottom of it. Community makes a big difference as well. This is something that Solaris can learn from Linux. A large community means you have QA sites have performance tips. Uh, conference talks on performance, like this one. Weird issues are more likely found and fixed by someone else. A lot, a lot of people are using it and trying it. More case studies are shared. What tuning and configurations worked. And so that's something that Solaris can learn from Linux. Linux users expect a Google question and find an answer on Stack Overflow. And uh, try, try that for Solaris. It's, it's, it needs to get better. Uh, either foster a community or sh to share content on tuning tools and configuration. I have staff to create a content. Hire a good community manager uh, because they can really help make these things happen. Another thing Solaris can learn from Linux is compiler options. I mentioned this earlier where I have started to see things like this. Developers are often writing software on Linux now. And that platform gets the most attention. It works on my system. Uh, and I've also seen this for 64-bit versus 32-bit. We're talking about uh, compiling up software, to, to putting this stuff into main files. It didn't actually make sense. Now, if I said, if Dev Linux use Futex, that's fine. Because Solaris doesn't have Futexes. We're talking about, if Dev Linux do optimizations, the rest of the world can, can just suck on it. Um, and that. But that isn't necessary because uh, operating systems like SmartOS can, GCC is going to work fine with optimizations. Um, compiler op optimizations are also extremely hard to debug, extremely hard to debug. And uh, it's also really hard to explain. 
if I show you, a customer shows me an application that says I'm unhappy with performance, and I profile it, I get a flame graph, and everything looks fine. And if you ask me what performance is left on the table, I might say, well, none. It's, this, this application is really well tuned. Something can happen in the world. And then, my, what I said was true, one minute, and then a minute later, what I said was false. Actually, what I'm looking at, the performance profile of the system, it could be 20% faster, but nothing changed. Uh, what happened was some compiler engineer had an idea of, oh, I can do an optimization and change how one of these code paths is compiled and, and inline this or do telco optimization of that. And so, as a performance, I'm trying to debug and I'm trying to look for a problem. I can't find a problem because from one moment to the next, this is state-of-the-art performance. There is 0% left on the table to find. And then because some compiler engineer adds a new option, oh, now, now you're on the slow stuff. I can't believe you're running that. But there's no difference. It's the same, I'm looking at the same profile. Anyway, that's just an insight into my life when I'm debugging these things. Um, I use flame graphs and you try and, if you're lucky, you can actually get a flame graph on both, the, both systems with different compiler options and see that, oh yeah, you, you, in, you got rid of this function. And so on the faster system, it's fewer stack frames. Anyway, it's maddening. It's really hard to debug. Um, dealing with this from system to system, it can be addressed in, by tuning packages in the repo. Uh, and the people who are looking after the repo should know which optimizations to do. Likely, unlikely is another difference. And throughout the Linux kernel, uh, you'll see if likely, do this. If unlikely, do that. The slice kernel doesn't do this yet. The likelies and unlikelies are compiler hints. So these, these help the compiler understand branch prediction. And in theory, should help performance a little bit. As a kernel engineer, it's not actually difficult for me to do because when I'm writing code, I know what's likely and what's unlikely. Usually I know what's likely and what's unlikely. If likely do the main code path, this is the error path. So if unlikely, you hit an error and do this. So the tax for the kernel engineer to add these to the kernels shouldn't be large. And if it gives you just a small percentage of improvement, that's great. Uh, I don't actually know if the slice kernel is built using there's a way you can, you can do profiler feedback of an active system and then feed that, like, feed that back into the compiler so that it can then understand based on real profile data what branch prediction should do. I, don't, I, I, don't, I haven't heard of anyone doing that, but uh, they may be doing that within Oracle, I don't know. The actual performance difference is likely to be small, but it's something that Slice could learn from Lens. It could be adopted by kernel engineering. Uh, it may also help readability, it may not. I mentioned to this to some co-workers and they were and the opinion varied a lot. It's uh, almost to, to the point of hostility. Some people, yes, it helps. I believe it helps readability. And other people think it actually hurts readability. So, uh, tickless kernel. Another thing that Solanus can learn from Linux. Linux does this already. It's dintex. It reduces interrupts and improves processor power saving. It means you don't have a clock routine that's running at 100 hertz or 1,000 hertz. And so if, when CPUs go to sleep, they're not interrupted and woken up all the time and having to go into different power saving modes. Uh, it also reduces interruptions. There's another, there's something more important, um, well, it depends on the requirements. I will occasionally hit performance issues where a customer has moved an application from Linux to SmartOS and said, I get these weird 10 millisecond latencies. And they're using an older API to do timeouts and it's getting blocked on the tick. And when we set high-res tick to one, now they get one millisecond latency. It's really sad. Linux doesn't suffer this problem. Linux has done dynamic ticks, so it's a tickless kernel. Uh, Sun and Oracle did start work on this years ago, but they need to finish it. Another thing that uh, Slides can learn from Linux, Linux doesn't do process swapping at all. Uh, in Linux, when we say swapping, we mean paging. Process swapping made sense on the PDP 11 slash 20. I believe that's a PDP 11 slash 20 based on what I can see. If you have a high resolution picture of this, send it to me, But because um, you can't actually read it, but based on the switches. That system had a maximum process size of 64 kilobytes, and when Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie designed Unix, paging already existed. The notion of doing uh, managing virtual memory, uh, allowing more programs to run in main memory than can fit in main memory, uh, that notion existed since the Atlas computer. 
But they chose not to do it because the Unix was supposed to be simple. They chose just to do process swapping where you move the entire process to the physical swap device and back to main memory because the largest process was only 64 kilobytes. So the difference between process swapping and paging, paging which may be 4 kilobytes or 8 kilobytes, was not that huge. Um, although these days, process swapping doesn't make a lot of sense. Paging was added in later in BSD that in those code paths, which are now um, in Solaris and OpenStars and Lumos, we still have process swapping. And it's something we can learn from Linux is consider ditching process swapping. It, we really don't want to have uh, production systems doing process swapping. You already have paging. That works. That's a mechanism. And you actually, we do waste time learning the difference. Like I have to do this when I write books of like, hey, in Solaris, if you go through the uh, virtual memory system, it's like a walk through time. We've got the original Unix swapping, then we go into BSD. Up here, we've, we get the cyclic page cache that's sung from uh, the 90s, and then we've got CFS that's, that's sung 2005. It's like history from early Unix to today, but all the code's still there, it's all running, and we're just making people learn all this. When we could cut, simplify and code out, it's, it is actually a tax, a burden for the end users to learn when maybe we don't need process swapping. Another thing science can learn from Linux is uh, Linux has overcommitted the Uncular, uh, and this, this may be, I, I tell this to science people who are completely new to this concept, on Linux, malloc may never fail. Uh, there's no virtual memory limit, uh, depends on your VM overcommit memory. Uh, on Solaris, there is a virtual memory limit, main memory bus plus swap, that's the default. More use of memory can be allocated than can be stored, and that may be great for small devices like my phone, uh, running applications that sparsely use the memory they allocate. Uh, but at some point, the lie is, is, has to be exposed, and so when processors who have malloced, and that's returned true, and the system can't actually give you the pages of memory, it can't even give you pages of memory on the physical swap device. It's like, I, there's just no way I can store the memory that I told you you malloced successfully. Like, sorry, I lied. Uh, Linux can uh, use the OOM killer. And so find a process based on the OOM score and then kill it. And uh, that seems uh, somewhat insane to a Solaris audience who are running servers, not running mobile phones, so don't quite understand the embedded market maybe. Um, on servers, when, when you're running databases and, and what have you, you don't want the kernel to just decide to kill a database because it, uh, it uses more memory. You accidentally configured it wrong. And now it's getting um, sent kill signals. Incidentally, the OOM score is just added to HTOP. So you can configure HTOP with the OOM score. So at least you get some observability of it. So I can learn why not to do this, I think. It's, it's a cautionary tale. Um, so remember, Solaris is not big in embedded devices, and so I, I'm sure you can make a use case for it there. Um, the, the main use case for Solaris and SmartOS is running on server operating systems, and um, the OOM killer is, would be a big problem. Overcommit is also why so much new code doesn't check for enomem, because the kernel doesn't return uh, enomem on Linux by default, default configuration. And so we end up with software that the developer could have written could have written a code path that made sense when you ran out of memory, but they didn't because they know the kernel's not going to return in on So why bother checking? And so that's that's not a good thing as well. Like, like, the, the world where the, the the application developer can write more meaningful code paths so the, so the application performs correctly and doesn't just get killed is uh, is what happens if you turn that off. Slab is another thing Slab can learn from Linux. So Solaris created this, the kernel slab allocator, and that was integrated into Linux and became the default. Linux then simplified it with a slot allocator, and so maybe the slot could go back into Solaris. Uh, slot removed object queues and post CPU caches, leaving new op optimization to the page allocated free lists, which did some of that stuff anyway. Um, is it worth considering? We don't know because we haven't investigated it, but it's, it seems something worthwhile to learn. Uh, the size can learn from Linux. Lazy TLB is another big big difference. Uh, Linux has lazy TLB mode, which is a way to delay TLB updates or shutdowns. TLB is a translation look side buffer. When you're doing virtual physical memory translation, the, it's, it's expensive to ask the kernel to do it, so the processor usually has a cache. Uh, because anytime you're doing loads and stores, of course, we're working in a virtual memory system, and unless you turn that off, in which case you're insane, but you, you're working in a virtual memory system and it has to translate the virtual to physical addresses somehow. TLB cache helps, 
Unfortunately, for multiprocessor systems, you have distributed TLB caches on all those sockets on CPUs, processors, and you need to keep them in sync. And so, for example, a process exits or process un unmaps a region, uh, you need to tell the other processors to invalidate CPUs to invalidate the TLB cache. And that can actually start to get expensive. And so Linux has this way called lazy TLB mode where it can decide for certain regions of kernel code, we're not going to do these interprocessor cross calls right now for a while. We're going to let them batch up and then we're going to send them out as a group. This does show up. It shows up because I'm profiling applications that are doing, your application has to do a lot of mmaps, mmaps frequently. And on Linux, things are fine. And on Solaris, you're burning up CPU because you're doing CPU cross calls. And it's, it's, this is something that, that, is, that is really a war if I start discussing it with the other kernel engineers. I'll be throwing chairs across the room. Because by the Solaris uh, audience, they often see lazy TLB as reckless. It's like, how can you just, you have to keep caches in sync. You can't delay the cache updates. It's what if the other CPU, when accessed that, that memory range and got an invalid range, in invalid memory address. But the thing is, it's, your application shouldn't do that. And so the counter argument is, one of the counter arguments is, if, if one of my threads M unmaps a region, and then another thread then goes and reads from that region, I wrote bad code. I shouldn't write code that does that. So um, anyhow, and the, and the other counter argument is Linux does have the API for batching them up, um, and so I can do it in a, in a clever way. So anyway, this is, this is something that, uh, it, it is kind of seen as reckless by, uh, in some in the Slash community at the moment, but it's something that does affect performance and needs to be investigated, quantified, checked that systems can run correctly with it and uh, possibly fixed. Another big difference Slash can learn from Linux is time weight recycling. Linux is really good at time weight recycling. When you have TCP sessions going to time weight, and this is the 5x performance difference I debugged this year so far, where on Linux, this simple benchmark the customer was doing would run at 5,000 connections per second, and on smart OS, you'd begin at 5,000, and then you'd go down to about 1,000. And what happened is the, the, the TCP slots filled up with sessions in time weight, and these, the, the Lumos kernel was not good at recycling those sessions, whereas Linux is. So it only happens if you're benchmarking from a single client host to a single port. So it's, not, it's, it's annoying because customers see it in benchmarking, but you don't generally see this in production because you're, uh, you've fanned out the connections across many clients. But it's something that Slice could certainly learn. And the last thing is SAR. Linux SAR is awesome. It has lots of extra options. Um, the columns make sense. They're meaningful. Like, yeah, there's, a, there's a convention that works. A slash S per second. So kilobytes, it's got TCP stats in there, dev stats in there, and the Slice SAR uh, does not. The Slice SAR uh, really needs uh, desperate updating, and uh, something needs to be fixed for the 21st century, something Slice can learn from Linux. Uh, it's, it was so bad that right, there's been times where I've recommended we disable SAR on Slice systems because it's harmful. Like the, having metrics that we know are out of date and broken, we'd rather turn it off and turn it back on once we've fixed it. So sun needs to be fixed. Oh, and there was one more, KVM. KVM that Linux added for hardware virtualization. Uh, it's versus Zen for type one hypervisors. KVM is, in terms of performance, it's great for a couple of reasons. One, you have better performance observability because KVM is running in the host OS. And I can, I can bring my host operating system tools to bear on it. And two, KVM can use OS resource controls like any other process. So you benefit from the OS resource controls the system has. Um, and Solaris has not, well, Oracle Solaris doesn't have it yet. We actually did learn this at Giant, and we ported KVM to a Lumos and SmartOS. And uh, this is now why I'm using Linux a lot in production. It works really well. So that was a, a, a brief set of things that Solaris can learn from Linux. Now what Linux can learn from Solaris. So either learning what to do or learning what not to do. CFS. Um, CFS is great. I think a lot of people know, know this already. More performance features than you can shake a stick at. Um, and I've worked on CFS in the past. Lots and lots. The ARC can actually make a big difference, the, which is the in-memory cache, because it can resist perturbations and stay warm. 
it, it kind of can, it, it sounds a bit unusual when they say, oh, Cephas is a great cache. Well, well how, is, how is the cache policy that different from one to another? It's, well, if you do a backup and you don't have a good cache policy, you can flush the cache and now everything's cold. Someone does a system backup or perturbation. Uh, ZFS IO throttling was added in Lumos and that can throttle disk IO the ZFS layer to solve uh, cloud noisy neighbor issues. Um, and ZFS has been used in critical environments. So, I mean, this is not the feature list of ZFS. This is what I wrote for the performance feature list. It's, it's got a ton of features. Linux has been learning this. And so there is the ZFS on Linux project and they're using it for high performance computing and they've been uh, fixing things and, and, and using it heavily and it seems to be coming along pretty well. Anyone in the room using CFS on Linux? Show of hands. So we have like ooh, between five and ten people. Great. So if you saw those hands, you can ask them for help on how to get set up. <laughs> um, see, uh, Linux does have ButterFS as well, which is another modern file system based on the same philosophies of pooled storage and all the enterprise features. Zones is another thing Linux can learn from Solaris. The ancestry for zones was ch root, FreeBSD jails, and Solaris zones. It's always virtualization. And so I can create server instances like, say, cloud computing, where the, the overhead of going from your process to metal is identical. Because this is a, it's partitioning up the operating system. It's not encapsulating your process in any extra lanes. And if you look at the code path from your process to metal, it's the same, the same code path. If you look at the code path for Xen or KVM, there's a lot of steps. And especially if you're doing uh, high-speed network I.O., you are sensitive to those steps, and it slows you down. I have drawn the initial I.O. control flow. There are all sorts of feature optimizations between these that make it faster once they go in flight, like memory ring buffers. But uh, it's, when I'm benchmarking zones versus KVM or zones versus Xen, it's really an unfair competition because zones are something. It's like bare metal performance versus virtualization. Because it is bare metal performance, there's no extra layers. Uh, oh, I did put a slide of some numbers, and like um, maximum network throughput is literally 10 times faster um, for our KVM versus our zones, uh, and, and IOPS is four times faster. And this is another, it's not just about the speed, it's also about observability. And so if I'm debugging a performance issue on zones, I analyze it just like I would any other application because I have my, my cloud server instances running here, there's only one kernel, and I use my regular observability tools. If I'm doing performance analysis of KVM, it's actually really hard. I have the guest, which is running under Kimu, I have the host kernel, and I have this observability boundary. When I'm logged into the host, I get to see what's happening with the resources, but I can't see what's happening inside the guests. And if I want to correlate them, then it gets time consuming. I can log into the guest and get information from here, but generally I need to do analysis in here and analysis in here, and then correlate them both. And things just get so much, so much slower. And I, I'm doing the zones performance analysis and KVM performance analysis daily. And in KVM, things generally take five to 10 times longer to debug. Uh, complicated things because of doing all the correlations. Linux has been learning this. So LXC and C groups, not widespread adoption yet, but Docker will likely drive that adoption. So LXC is the, the same idea. We're going to do OS virtualization and partition up the operating system. Streams. Another thing Linux can learn from Solaris is streams. It's like Unix shell pipes, but for kernel messages. Introduced fully in Unix 8th edition. I was excited because I think it's the first time I've mentioned Unix 8th edition in a talk, and it'll be the last time. Usually I'm mentioning other editions. Um, with greater demands for TCP IP performance, streams actually was a bad idea. It reduced scalability. And so this is something Linux can learn from Slice if it hasn't already, is it's a cautionary tale. It's some, something that Sun tried for high-speed code paths, and it gave Sun a really bad reputation of uh, being slow RS because of the, all the extra stuff. And so Sun had to then go and change to be direct function calls like Linux did. So streams, a cautionary tale. Symbols. Uh, something Linux can learn from Slice is symbols. Compilers on Linux generally strip symbols by default and it makes performance profile output inscrutable without the debug symbol packages. 
And this is really, really annoying. And so like, I'm using perf or whatever, and I just get hex numbers. Um, on Solana systems, symbols aren't stripped. You have CTF by default, which is a C compact type format. And so any performance profile I, I run, I generally see symbols. I also generally see stacks. Another thing common on Linux is to drop the frame pointers, and it makes stack, getting stack traces from things hard. And it's another thing that's really, it's, it's, I, I really don't think it's worth it. Please use F, no emit frame pointer to stop this madness. I know Perf events just did a workaround. You do minus G dwarf to use libunwind, which helps. But uh, dropping the frame pointer will give you a minuscule performance improvement. But the, the pain of performance observability means you don't go and find some low hanging fruit. And overall, your system is, is in the fullness of time, your system is slower than it should have been. So I, I really disagree with dropping it. And, um, and having symbols by default, so, the, so when there's a performance issue, you can immediately start analyzing it. Uh, so let's keep symbols and stacks. The mean time to flame graph is very fast. Flame graph is a visualization I've done for, you can do it for all sorts of different profilers where I can see the CPU usage by function. But it doesn't work if there's no symbols, and it doesn't work if there's no stack traces. So I, mean, I, can, I can, if you say on a Solana system, my CPUs are hot in the user space, and my CPUs are hot in the kernel, I can have this in five minutes. And say, so, well, it's hot because of this. Uh, on Linux, it depends whether the symbols are there, it depends whether I, I can do stack traces. Um, and it would be great if, if, and of course, Linux is serving different markets, and there's desktop use and embedded use, but for the server builds, Server builds always had symbols by default. That would be great. PS that minus MLC. Uh, this is per thread time broken down into states. And it's, it's an unsung hero of Solaris, but this actually solves a ton of issues. It's where thread time is broken up into user system, trap, text fault, data fault, lock time, sleep, and CPU latency. The dispatch queue latency is it's called in, in uh, Solaris, or scheduler latency. And immediately, based on this breakdown, I've come up with the thread state analysis method where it then directs your investigation to the, to the next issue. Uh, Linux doesn't have microstate accounting, but there is, there is actually a lot of frameworks. So there's delay accounting, there's IO accounting, shed stats. You can get something similar, but if, if you were able, able to add these columns to HTOP. So, uh, I'll get this, I mean, HTOP just had the um column added, so it'd be great if more columns were added so that you could apply the TSA method. Um, because like I said, it is an unsung hero of Solaris. It solves a ton of issues like Dtrace does. DFS stack, customers often, when I'm looking at IO issues and you've only got IO stat, you can get a little bit too wet to the idea that disks are causing you pain. Uh, disks, often operate asynchronously to what your application is doing. And so uh, we've added VFS stat to SmartOS, where it's basically IO stat, but up at the VFS layer. And that is showing you what your application is experiencing. Whereas down here, this is very simple. So don't worry, don't worry too much about that. Start with VFS stat, and then go down deep. And so it'd be great to have something like that in Linux. Ah. Dtrace. And so Dtrace is... Uh, we all know what Dtrace is by now. It's used on Solaris, Lumos, Mac OS X, and FreeBSD. Solve virtually any performance issue. So the 15% Perl del delta I showed earlier, no matter where that problem is, uh, with Dtrace, you will solve it. And without the capabilities of Dtrace, you may have to wear the 15%, which is sad, because it may just be something dumb, like, oh, you get a different version of OpenSSL, or different this that you can easily fix on Linux. So being able to solve the low-hanging fruit is really important. Users can write their own Dtrace scripts on one liners. Uh, these are some of my Dtrace scripts from the Dtrace toolkit and the Dtrace book. I'm kind of running out of space. But, uh, <laughs> every, everything, I'll, 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 everything can be observed. I think that makes the point. But what Linux needs to learn about Dtrace is it's not about dynamic tracing. The, the point of this isn't... The point, the, the, the most important thing to learn is you're building a tool that we're going to use in production to solve problems. That's what you're going to do. And if I can't run it in production because it's not safe, then it, it's not serving its number one purpose. And so the number one thing to learn is it, production safety. There should be no risk of panics or freezes. Dtrace has been used in production. I know it's been enabled 24 by 7 
on some systems for a long time. And uh, the, the Linux equivalents need to get to that point. As they say, features are features of users don't use them. So if you're not using the Linux equivalents, and, and I hesitate to use them in production because I worry about safety. So DTrace for Linux, PerfectVents, KTAP, SystemTap, and LTT and G. Uh, the Linux kernel already has the necessary frameworks. Uh, there's one more thing Linux can learn from Solaris. DTrace has a memorable, unofficial mascot. The Ponycorn by Deirdre Swan is sitting down at the front. Uh, she's created these for Linux too, so Linux doesn't have a, uh, a pony gap. Here's the Dtrace for Linux Ponycorn. And uh, Ponycorn, this is magical, you know, what Dtrace does. It's Dtrace for Linux, mostly by Paul Fox. It's not production safe yet. I have actually used it to solve issues by reproducing them in the lab. And Oracle has their own port of Dtrace that they've been working on. And they, in December 2013, they said that they, they had full Dtrace integration with Linux. I don't think it's complete. I don't think either are complete. Uh, here's an example I was, I was doing yesterday on the latest uh, uh, Dtrace for Linux port where I'm showing the distribution of ext4 rewrite size using Dtrace for Linux. Um, I redid my tspeed retransmit script so you can trace when the kernel decides to retransmit, who is it retransmitting to, and what is the stack backtrace? So it looks like the timestamps broke. So that's Dtrace for Linux. Perf Events has a different pony. Perf Events is in the Linux tree. It's the Perf Tools package. Uh, it can do sampling, static and dynamic tracing, although it's a traditional profiler. And so it has the cycle of enable, click, dump, and analyze. Uh, it's actually really powerful. Anyone use Perf Events or Perf? So I've got uh, fewer than 10 hands. It's great, you should use it. It's, uh, it's, it's part of the Linux kernel tree. Um, as an example, I'm using Perf to do dynamic tracing of TCP send message with size, and it works. There are overheads with it because it um, doesn't uh, do in-kernel aggregations, but it does give you a whole heap of uh, performance capabilities you don't normally have. KTAP is a new one for Linux. And it's simple, lightweight, based on Lua, uses bytecode uh, for programmable and safe tracing. Um, it's suitable for embedded Linux. Features are limited. I can't recommend it yet because it's not, uh, it's in development, it may not be production safe. Here's a demo of KTAP where I'm looking at um, the histogram of syscall read size. And like from another one of my scripts where I'm doing uh, latency deltas. So one of the great things about KTAP is I, last time I installed it, I got it working in five minutes on Ubuntu. And uh, that, that is very different than the other traces. It's just quick to get it going, um, it works. KTAP has actually been pretty impressive. I have not had KTAP panic my system yet. Now, I said I, I wouldn't trust it for production use yet because it's in development, but so far it's actually looking really impressive. And the KTAP, which is new, may come out of nowhere and be the dynamic tracer for Linux because of what I've seen so far. There's SystemTap. Um, SystemTap for sampling, it, 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 it's similar to Dtrace, it actually does more than Dtrace. There's more features in it. And uh, has its own tracing language. I used it a lot a while ago and had lots of issues of panics and freeze, freezes. I tried to use it recently so I could just do demos in this talk. And it's better, so it does try and help you now. So uh, I'm running it on Ubuntu, and I know that's my first mistake. Um, it's saying, you should go read this file. Oh, and I read the file. You should go run that command. I run that command. Oh, you should go read this website. So I read the website, and now uh, I'm installing two gigabytes of data. I'm going to wait an hour before I can use SystemTap. <laughs> so completely different experience to KTAP, where I've got KTAP working in five minutes. In fairness, the Red Hat SystemTap developers' primary focus is to get it working on Red Hat because that's what they do. That's, that's the operating system they look after. Where well, they say it works fine, and so um, I'm not doing it on the, the main operating system. And the lack of CTF doing all this stuff is not really their fault. It's what I said earlier about Linux not having symbols. Uh, I've got an example there. LTTNG is the Linux trace toolkit. The mas it actually has a mascot, which is a mole with glasses on. Uh, it's, uh, and it was based on LTT, which dabbled with dynamic tracing in 2001, before Dtrace existed, Linux was doing dynamic tracing. 
Um, it has, it's a tradi traditional style tracer, so it has the enable start stop view cycle that's designed to be highly efficient. 2014 should be an exciting year. I don't know which of these is going to win, but uh, KTAP is actually looking really promising. SystemTap would be in the lead because it's, uh, it's, it's had a lot of work put into it. But uh, the, just the safety of KTAP so far, the speed of getting it going, it's actually looking really promising. I had to put uh, Perf Events and LTT and G last because they're traditional style traces, and these ones have the internal aggregations which make a big difference. On the final world, well, uh, Oracle Flask can learn something about D-Trace on Linux. Dynamic tracing is crippled without source code. Uh, and Oracle Science is not open source. Now, Oracle could give customers scripts to run, but it's, you lose the practical chance of, of writing scripts yourselves. If I was to run, write D-Trace scripts for Oracle Solaris, it's like, I don't have access to source code, so if I'm doing dynamic tracing, I don't know what these DFS functions mean anymore. They might have changed. It's actually really hard. Um, there, there's this weird, you know, Something that might happen is, in the future, which would definitely be weird for the Slice folk, is where the D-Trace for Linux port is completed and it's more useful, useful than the Oracle Solaris D-Trace. And so at that point, you can phone your Solaris buddies and say, hey, you should switch to Linux. We've got this great feature. It's called D-Trace. <laughs> and that's really going to hurt. Because Oracle Solaris will, will be the only operating system where D-Trace is actually crippled. You can't use all the features because you don't have source code. They may open source it and, and things will be fine. The last thing I wanted to mention for the differences is culture. Some microsystems out of necessity did have a performance culture, an appetite for understanding and measuring the system, data-driven analysis. And, uh, and there's a reason for that. Sun was, was selling large uh, equipment and people would demand answers if they didn't perform. On Linux, uh, Linux performance issues are often debugged using just a few tools. Like it, it, I almost start wondering if the kernel looks like this. Uh, the top layer of the applications, the S-trace layer, the TCP dump layer. This, it, this, the culture in Solaris is to, is to really understand the system, to use everything. And the question is, why, why aren't we using all the other tools? Why aren't we using perf events and trace points and k-probes and u-probes? And this may be a, a more of a cultural thing, is uh, the, the thirst for understanding the system and doing data-driven analysis. This, some of this happening in Linux, and some people are definitely doing this, but it was, it was something that some deliberately cultivated. Uh, what both can learn is benchmarking, and uh, benchmarking is how these two are often evaluated, and it's incorrect or misleading basically 100% of the time. And I recommend active benchmarking where you use analysis tools to see why, what went wrong, and that will explain it. Uh, results is the final section I've got. So out of the box, what is faster, Linux or Solaris? I didn't really say that. I didn't, haven't mentioned that so far. I've just mentioned uh, differences. It's basically a crapshoot if you do it out of the box. I've seen everything from 5% to 5x differences either way. It depends on the workload and platform characteristics. It really depends on which code parts you're in. From my prior comparisons, SmartOS for heavy file system or network I.O. and Linux for CPU bound workloads uh, because of uh, application versioning and CPU affinity. Uh, out of the box isn't that relevant because if you do care about performance, you should do a bit of analysis. So in practice, what's faster? In practice, I can generally make SmartOS faster than Linux because I will use D-Trace and microstate accounting to go and fix all the bugs and make it go faster. Uh, and I can do the same on Linux and make a big smart OS, but it's more time consuming without a fully feature, without a system tap that I can run that I know is safe or KTAP being finished. In practice, it, the analysis tool makes a big difference when you're doing these things head to head. Because the analysis tool means did you find and fix all the dumb stuff, or do you have to wear the dumb stuff? Do you have to wear all those 15% because I couldn't debug them? And it's unfair for Linux because you have a, Linux has a very fast kernel. But can I analyze and solve that? Um, so at Joint, we do build SmartOS instances that frequently beat Linux. And I wanted to mention, it's not just the OS. It is because of hardware and configuration as well. And I, this talk included lots about what Slars could learn from Linux. 
But smart OS, which we have, we've already been learning things from Linux. And so KVM, for example, has been ported. And we know we have to fix TCP time weight. We know we should just port SAR from Linux to SLAS because the Linux version is so much better. Um, and there's mo more to do. So that's a quick tour of differences between the systems. It's, uh, it's really fascinating to see how the, how, how the two systems differ. And um, by comparing and understanding them, both of them can end up being faster in the future. So thank you.